So the first question is from Steve Darrow, and he asks, uh, conservatives are proponents of school vouchers and for-profit schools, but I believe that there would have to be some standard a school must meet to be accredited. What subject mastery would you consider the minimum for a student to be considered a high school graduate? That's a really good question. Um, uh, I'll tell you, Steve, given the quality of uh, public education today, no offense to the, uh, cons to the teachers out there who've been fighting against this whole time, but what it's become, I think anybody who watched and understood Ken Burns' Civil War uh, uh, documentary would be uh, a history graduate as far as I'm concerned. And I hate to say this, but the standards are so low that, um, that anything would be an improvement now over what we're getting. And things just like social promotion, just get rid of all of that stuff, just that alone. And any class where you spend you know, an hour a day in history for nine months out of the year, I think is going to be better than what they're getting now. Um, history should be taught in such a way that it's interesting, which, again, is the main reason, another reason I'm so interested in this computer game thing. If I try to tell millennials about what happened in 1776 and 1783, they just glaze over. So we're going to make all of those problems, problems that we have to face a thousand years from now. We're going to have to face pirates, and we're going to have to face a powerful empire, and we're going to have to figure out how do we build up our strength without getting too conspicuous, and do we have a chance to... You know, all of these problems we're going to deal with in real time in the future, and, and we're going to make history something interesting. So I, I really don't know what the standards of, uh, of accreditation should be, but I do know that they would have to be really, really something very simple, I think. Um, uh, there are just a number of things that were on, uh, I guess, Bone Canoe said, you go back to classical education standards in the West 100 years ago, you look at that, um, that document, that school test that seventh graders had to pass or something from 1903. So if it, it would, you know, in astronomy, I would want people to know, um, well, first of all, I'd like them to know some astronomy. You know, in science class, I'd, I'd do a couple months on astronomy. Um, and I think if you're going to graduate high school in astronomy, just as an example of something that I know relatively well off the top of my head now, I would say that a high school student in astronomy should be able to name the eight planets of the solar system. I almost said nine, but I caught myself. Uh, in order, um, be able to draw an approximation of their relative sizes. Um, would be able to tell us the composition of the sun. Uh, I think a high school graduate in astronomy should know what a main sequence star is. I think an uh, uh, astronomy graduate should know the difference between population one and population two stars. I think a, that person should be able to determine uh, the difference between um, uh, a meteoroid, an asteroid, a planetoid, a planet, terrestrial planet, a gas giant planet, brown dwarf star, a red dwarf star, main sequence G-type star, and then a hot star like Vega or Altair or something like that. And mo most importantly in astronomy, I would think that they should have um, a, a pretty good sense of the structure of the universe. When I say the structure of the universe, I simply mean the scale. Um, I've mentioned it several times before, but there's a book called, uh, a, a video called Powers of Ten where um, it starts out with a couple, it's many years old now, it was out when I was a boy, and I think they've done an updated version of it. But in the original, you see this photograph of this couple picnicking in Central Park, these two people lying down on a blanket, and they start with them because this is the world we know, this is the world of people. And it starts to head up into the sky, in other words, starts to zoom out, and around them you see a box, and that box is a one-meter box, and they're all, all of them are able to sit inside this one-meter box. And, continue to pull out. Now there's a 10 meter square box and that's just basically the immediate area. Now there's a 100 square meter box that's about the size of a football field uh, of equal, uh, four equal sizes. And as the camera continues to pull out, these boxes get, they just continue to shrink and every box is another power of 10. Um, so I would like to be able to say that a high school student in astronomy, just as one example, should be able to do what I was challenged to do on, on one of my um, flight exams. 
uh, for my pilot rating. And that is, look at a chart of the airspace of, of uh, Los Angeles, for example, and he pointed to a spot on the map with his pencil and says, tell me about the airspace as you continue to go vertically up off of that map. And I thought, oh, awesome. Okay, so on the ground here, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's class uh, echo airspace. It's not uncontrolled like G, but it's class echo. And then as I get higher, I'm underneath the, you know, the class Charlie of, you know, Burbank Airport. And as we get higher, I'm into the class, um, you know, uh, um, Bravo of uh, LAX. And above that, I'm at, you know, Alpha Airspace all the way up to, was it, 60,000 feet. And above that, I'm in uncontrolled airspace. Again, that kind of thing. So, so a um, high school graduate should be able to say, if I say to him or her, describe what would happen if you were to get, if you were to just go straight up into the air right now and just keep going. I would see the planet Earth, it's about 8,000 miles across, and I would continue to move away, move away, and the moon, which is about a, you know, about a six of that size, maybe something like that, but very much further away than people think. So now we have the Earth and the moon, and as we continue to go up, we can see that they're in orbit around the sun, and here's the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, moon, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and so on, and as these things continue to shrink, they're now just the, or the soul system and shrinks and shrinks and shrinks because they're nothing but nothing but nothing and shrinks. And then finally we see Alpha Centauri start to come in. And then as we continue to zoom out, we start to see the seven or eight, ten stars in the, in the immediate local group. And as we continue to zoom out, we you know, begin to see the structure of this particular arm of the galaxy. And as we zoom out some more, we see the structure of the Milky Way galaxy. And we zoom, 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 zoom. And then we see the Magellanic clouds, which are orbiting our galaxy, and then we zoom, 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 and there's a Andromeda, the biggest um, uh, galaxy in our local group of galaxies, and then we zoom out some more, and then we see it's a cluster of galaxies, and then we get to the general overall structure of the universe. I actually think that everybody who graduates high school should have some fundamental um, knowledge of how these things work. What is the universe structure? Where do I live in it? What is my relative size? <clears throat> and I live in a city where among the many ongoing tragedies of what um, progressives have done to everything, um, I live in a city where I guarantee you there are a million people who live within 10 or 15 miles of uh, the Pacific Ocean and they've never seen the Pacific Ocean. Um, there are significant numbers of people in the city that I live in who've, who've never been on an airplane. And, um, and I think what I would like to do is I would like to get it to a place where um, no matter how poor you are, that given a choice between getting a new pair of uh, track shoes or, or taking a flight to San Francisco and back, I would, I, I, I cannot imagine having my imagination so stunted that I could live in a world where jet aircraft are passing over me every day and I've never had the experience and never want to have the experience. I took a ride in uh, 1973. It cost a lot of money when I was working at the planetarium. My first paycheck was $32 before the airlines were deregulated. There was a voyage to, um, I want to say, is it, is it Santa Cruz? Uh, no, I forget the island where, um, where uh, Columbus first landed. Veracruz, I want to say, maybe. I don't know. In any event, it was the 300th anniversary or 400th or whatever. For, uh, 500th anniversary. And, um, and there was a flight. Eastern Airline flight to fly over the island, take off from Miami, fly over this island where, where um, Columbus first set foot ashore on the 500th anniversary of his landing. And it was a charter flight. It was real expensive. And I, um, I worked my tail off to get on it because it was a chance to fly in an airplane, uh, you know, fly in a, in a jet, 727. And they let me up in the cockpit when we circled, and it was really cool. Um, I have footage from that trip, and my friend uh, Phil Trick is in that picture. And also my friend Doug uh, Gagan, who just recently passed away. And uh, you're not going right, Bill? You're, you're back. 
Okay. Um, uh, and Doug is wearing a pair of triple knit polyester slacks that have a imprint that look like the kind of things that you use for ceiling tiles from um, from the days of you know uh, tin pressed indoor roofs. That man who walked through the frame, by the way, is an absolute hero. He's he's um, just an absolute hero. And I'll tell you a story about him a little later. Um, anyway, so that's what I would say in terms of the kind of thing I'm thinking of, uh, Steve. Um, 